I'm holding coffee in my hand, so we're going to use this for a very quick demo right at the start. So let's say if I just do this, I'm going to take a handful of coffee, granules, drop them, and we get a pattern that looks like that. Let me get rid of the rest of them. Question is, is that random? What do you think, Brady? Well, I guess there are sort of factors like the breeze in the room and the starting conditions. and. We could even ask, you know, do the, the coffee grains stick together somehow? Does that cause them to cluster? Is that, you know, giving rise to some of the pattern? But the interesting thing is we can eyeball it, and often, you know, physicists are as bad as many other people, and they'll eyeball a pattern and go, yeah, it looks pretty random to me. But actually, how do you work out if it's random? And what do I mean by random? What I mean, are the points uncorrelated? Is there no relationship between the positions of the grains? Are they entirely unrelated? There's one thing that connects all scientists, regardless of the discipline, physicists, chemists, biologists, it's that we look for patterns. That's, you know, either in data, in time, or in space. And we try to look for correlations, we try to look for relationships. But the problem is, we can be as easily fooled as everybody else, despite all our training and despite all our supposed mathematical thinking. Often, you ask us simple questions, and here's a good example. We've got two arrangements of dots on, uh, on, a, on a plane, on a, on a piece of paper. It's a, from this wonderful book by a guy called Stephen J. Gold, Bully for Brontosaurus. It's page 266. Which one's random, Brady? Which one's entirely random? So I've been asking a lot of people that very same question, Brady, and the vast majority, physicists or not physicists, will go, this is the random one. And you ask them why, and you say, well, actually, in this one, I can see sort of clusters and groups and chains and sort of correlations that, you know, you wouldn't expect if it was random. Turns out, this is the random one. So the interesting thing with this is that there are no spatial correlations here. These points are independent. And that clustering you see is the natural outcome of something called Poisson statistics. So Poisson statistics mean that you've got no relationship, no correlation between those points. They're completely independent of each other. In this case, what's actually, which looks to many people, looks more random. You don't see the clustering. It's not like you can pull out um, linear chains or clusters or even constellations if you think about the stars. With this one, what's happened is that instead of putting the points down completely at random, which a computer does here, you, put the comp uh, you choose the points at random, but you only fill in the box, as it were, you only fill in the dot if the surrounding neighbourhood is free of other points. So what we see here is that there was a natural correlation, a natural spatial relationship between the points here that isn't there. Often, you know, particularly just in our favourite paper last week, Brady, there was um, another instance of a story based on seeing the face of Jesus. But the face of Jesus has been seen in, you know, tea leaves and coffee stains and paints and taps and various many other weird and wacky and wonderful um, locations. And we scoff at that. And we say, well, you know, of course, this is just random. But again, it's a question of what do we mean when we say something is random? And how do we detect? And the way, the first thing that physicists turn to, which is sometimes not always the best way, but certainly it's the way I love, is something called Fourier analysis. And Fourier anal analysis is a remarkable method of basically decomposing images down into the component parts and looking, looking at them. It's like sort of almost particle physics for images, where you're breaking it down into its component parts and looking at the relationship between those various components and how they build up an image. The very interesting thing is that you can decompose these images, any image, not just these images, any image, anything on the internet can be de decomposed down into a sum of very simple, um, sort of like the algebra of images, very simple sine waves. And so, we can, I've got a few examples on screen. So what we have here is a very simple image of a wave, where what we have here is bright, dark, bright, but as you can see, it's a gradation. So what you have is bright intensity here going down to dark and then coming up. If we were to draw a line through this and look at how that intensity varies, what you'd get is a sine wave. So this is effectively a two-dimensional two sine wave. Okay. okay, so that's our basic unit. And what we can do is we can stretch that wave we can increase the frequency of that wave, so we can change the number. That's a terrible wave, but you get the idea. We can change the, the frequency and the wavelength of that wave. We can change the number of waves in a given you know, unit of length. 
and that's actually something called a spatial frequency. So what we can do is we take this sine wave and we take this sine wave. So this is a very arbitrary way of adding them together. But you'll see that as I add them and as I change the orientation of one with respect to the other, because this one is now transparent as I move it, it, is, it looks pretty cool, it looks quite psychedelic, but you know, it's, that's sort of what you'd expect. It's not the Mona Lisa. It's not the Mona Lisa. But what's remarkable is that, as I said, you can break any image down into those type of waves. And physicists do this all the time. Astronomers do this all the time. In terms of, the, for example, the cosmic microwave background, how do you analyze that? You see blobs? What, what, how are you actually going to pull information out of that? And we spend our life looking at images around us. We need to quantify those images. It's okay to eyeball something and say, well, there's a pattern there. But how do you actually know there's a pattern there? Where we've seen that you, know, you can have clusters forming very easily, just purely from a random process. What we're going to do here, we're going to build up an image, right? So that's actually four components, four different waves added together. Just with different orientations, perhaps different frequencies, different amplitudes, boring. What we're going to do now is just add more and more waves together, maybe nine. Still looks fairly boring. That's nine waves, is it? That's nine waves. So let's go to 64. Starting to see something coming out. Remember, all we're doing is we're taking those, breaking that image down into separate waves and adding them up. That's all we're doing. Nothing more sophisticated than that. And let's see we go to, let's go to 100 this time. Does it start to become a little bit recognisable? Maybe. I'll add some more components in, but I hope you can see the ripples, the waves. And it's not just this, I'm stressed, it's not just this image, it's any image we can do this with. Okay? So what's that, 400 waves? That was 400 waves. And we have to think about, and there's a very clever way of actually adding those waves together, and this is what Fourier analysis tells us. Fourier analysis tells us how much of the first wave you need, how much of the second wave, third, fourth, and uh, how you change the phase of those waves, the relationship, how you change the frequencies. Something and Brady... Ironic, something ironic about you doing Mr. Happy. Yeah, there is. Oh, well, I'm quite happy at the moment. <laughs> Look, I moved office. I've got a wonderful view. A yeah. wonderful new view. It's not the car park, so I'm sure it's the greenery that's um, made, me, made me happier. The question is then, how do you work out whether there are spatial correlations there? How do you work out whether these points are related? Well, one way of doing it is that you look at the waves that make up the image. And if those waves, um, by breaking down the image into those waves, you, can, you have a quantitative measure of just, you know, basically you can compare the Fourier components of two images. And from that, you can work out what the degree of randomness effectively is. So what we would do is we'd look at, for example, the amplitudes of the waves that we need to recreate the image and the frequency, right? And if it's entirely random, we don't see any particular peaks. However, if it's not random, which means that there's a particular correlation length, there's a particular um, feature spacing which is more common than the rest, then what we'll see, not drawn to scale, is a peak of some description. So if you did a Fourier analysis or a, or a wave amplification, as I called it, yeah, that's good. of, say, the Mona Lisa, yeah. You'd have a very distinct looking... You would indeed. You'd have a very distinct looking thing. And it's not just, okay, this is a very simple image. Let's, let's, let's work on another image. And let's do, say, nine Fourier components. Very indistinct. Let's go for, uh, let's go for 36 components. Start to look familiar? Looks like Elvis. Looks like Elvis. Okay. Let's go for 64. Better? Put you out of your misery and let's go for, say, 144 components. Oh, yeah. Right. If someone as handsome as Elvis. Uh, uh, indeed, indeed. So let's do a few more. Go for a thousand. A thousand. A thousand. Not a particularly well written bit of code for those of you who would be picky about the That's code. Okay. I'm not a well written bit of code. There oh, we yeah. go. And you can still see if we were added in more components, you get more and more. But you can see it, 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 it works. You've ended on a high. So, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> indeed. We could, we could end it there. <laughs> What this technique of Fourier analysis tells you is that actually to make a wave that looks like that, you have to add a whole bunch of sine waves together. And in the middle here, they all interfere with each other in a constructive way, so they all add up together.